Hey and welcome to day number 16 and in this episode I'm gonna show you how I have created the wheel suspension and the differential gear on the rear axle. I am very happy with how everything turned out so far. So let's do not waste any more time, switch over to Fusion and take a look at the new assembly. This is what the new zine looks like. You are already familiar with the chassis from the last video. And as you can see, I have removed all parts of the tracks for the moment so that I can focus solely on the rear axle. And this one can be lifted and lowered. So when you are following my videos, then you already know that the Saurer RK7 was able to drive on its wheels and on the tracks. And to drive on the tracks, it is necessary to lift up the front and the back wheels. And for the rear axles, it's um, quite difficult because they are connected by a differential gear in between and also this gear has to be hidden inside the base frame when you lift uh, the wheels and this was possible by a combination of a few links with uh, different joints in Fusion 360. Let me show you the component colors so that you can distinguish between the parts a little bit easier. And I also don't want you to focus too much on this cylindrical brackets. They will take up uh, another shaft later on that connects the front wheels with the rear wheels. And through this shaft, um, the up and down movement can be performed simultaneously for all four wheels. So I still have to build it together with the steering system and the suspension unit uh, on the front. But for now, let's take a look at the components that built the rear axle. And as you can see, I have still mounted the alternative design of the wheels to the vehicle. So uh, like I've already mentioned in a previous video, these are not the original wheels that were attached to the Saura RK7. This design was mounted by the US Army for testing purpose, but I've decided to continue with them because I like them a little bit more. Now we have here a central hub where the rim is connected. The wheels can be turned, of course, and behind this rim there is a drum brake. And behind the drum brake there is the actual suspension unit that consists of three parts connected with a few axes. And below is the actual central axis of the differential gear. And the differential gear is this big, almost sphere-like component part in the center of the base frame. And we also have um, uh, some assisting units or some assisting links on the left and on the right of the differential gear. And these guys help to keep this big part in place during the up and down movement. And when I take a look at the front of the differential gear, we have a carden shaft that is connected to the gearbox that sits close to the main engine that is located in the front of the vehicle. In this case, it is still missing, of course. And this axis allows the transmission of the torque through the shaft to the differential gear in the rear of the vehicle. Now, the carden shaft allows quite a bit of freedom of movement, and this is because um, the torque can be transmitted through an angle, so this axis doesn't have to be straight. And this becomes obvious when I lower the wheels like so, then you can see that this part is slightly angled and let me also ground the differential gear. So I revert the position first, then I right click on the differential gear, select ground. And now I can zoom in a little bit and start rotating uh, the carden shaft. It consists of three parts. So we have a part that is connected to the gearbox then we have a part that is connected to the shaft of the differential gear and we have uh, a link, a cross-like link in between and this cross-like link makes the movement um, along an angle uh, possible. And in this case, it was also necessary to divide it into two parts. So this part of the carbon shaft slides into the part of the differential gear and this is necessary because the shaft becomes a little bit longer or shorter whenever I move the differential gear up and down. So for this reason I have to unground it or I can also get rid of these little icons in the history and now I can move it up and down and it's actually hard to see but 
the shaft becomes slightly shorter and longer when I move the whole thing up and down. And this joint is called a cylindrical joint in Fusion 360. In the second part of this video, I'm gonna show you how I have created parts of the suspension unit and the differential gear by going through the history or through the timeline step by step and show you some tips and tricks. Let's take a look at the wheel suspension first and I'm gonna hide the rim and the tire so that we can see the actual suspension a little bit easier and I'm also gonna show the component colors. And here, let's take a look at the hub and the drum brake. So I'm gonna uh, select this component, right click on it, isolate it to get rid of everything else. And then let's go to the very beginning of the timeline and I've started with a simple sketch. As you can see, that's a profile. It's not fully defined yet. And you can tell this by all of these blue lines. I've only defined a couple of entities, especially these indentations here uh, for heat exchange. And I've wanted them to be in the same size. So every time you see a prefix like this FX before a dimension, it means that this one refers to another one. So in this case, the second and the third one are driven by the first one. And you simply do this by, let me get rid of this dimension here. You simply do this by add a dimension. And instead of adding a value, you simply click on a already existing dimension, then confirm this. And now this one refers to the one over here. So if I change this one from one to something like 1.3, everything else changes accordingly. Right, so this saves some time and it also makes adjustments a little bit easier. So let me finish the sketch and then I've simply applied a revolve command to turn this into the case or the housing of the hub and the drum brake. Next, I have drawn some circles on this top face and turned them into simple bolts with an extrusion. And then I have used the insert derive function to bring in a body from a different or from another design. So that's this knot here. And I have made it a little bit bigger with the scale function and used the align tool to position it on top of one of these bolts, followed by a circular pattern to create some copies. And when I open up now the bodies folder, you can see that it contains several different bodies. So the case and then a body for every nut. And um, I've used the combine tool to turn everything into one solid body. This operation was followed by a few additional extrusions. So this one made the bolts a little bit longer, like so. And then I've drawn another uh, small little nut on this central face here and I've used the circular pattern tool again to create a few copies. And I have finalized everything with uh, some chamfers and the fillet. Next, let's continue with the suspension and I'm gonna right click on the drum brake and unisolate everything. Then I'm gonna activate the suspension top level component. Again, it's always a good idea to keep everything nice and organized into different components. This is especially necessary when you are using joints later on to connect these components and the joints only work between components and not between bodies. And here let's select also the drum uh, mounting plate. I'm gonna isolate this one and let's see, there's a sketch active in it. It's this one here. And now I'm going back to the very first sketch in the timeline. It's a, a profile sketch again that I have turned into a plate by using the revolve feature. Then I have created another sketch on the right plane. So it's this one here and made an extrusion. And this extrusion was made on both sides of the sketch. So I'm using the two side um, settings here to extrude the sketch entities on the left and on the right. Then I have created another sketch, this time on the front plane. And I've used these sketch lines to make some cuts. So it's probably um, easier to see from behind. 
And this way I end up with two bodies, our main body in the center and dispensable material on the left and on the right. And then I've simply removed these uh, parts on the sides. And you can do this by right clicking on the corresponding body. So in this case, it was this one here. If you right click on it, do not select delete, but select remove instead. And this remove command gets added to the timeline. So it's this one here. And then I have mm, drawn another sketch again on the front plane. And I have used these sketch entities to cut away the piece in the center. Then I have made another extrusion to cut in the holes at the top and the socket for the axis in the center, followed by some additional extrusions. And then I have uh, rounded off everything with some fillets and some chamfers. Let's also take a brief look at some of the links. I'm gonna unisolate everything again. And probably the most interesting one is this one here. So every time you click on a component, it gets also highlighted in the browser tree. So you have this dotted line that marks the component that is currently selected. So I'm gonna activate this one right click on it, isolate it and go back to the very beginning of the history. So this one was pretty simple. I've started with um, a sketch, made an extrusion, mirrored this one to the other side, uh, made an additional sketch on the front plane and uh, used these sketch entities to cut the piece. And you can do this simply by drawing a sketch, then you go to modify and split the body and this lets you choose the body to split and the splitting tool, which was the sketch in this case. And this results in a set of different bodies. And then you can simply use the remove commands to get rid of these uh, guys, followed by an additional uh, simple extrusion of these four top planes. And then I've used the uh, offset face or the push and pull command to make these guys a little bit slimmer. I have placed another fillet on top of them to round off the edges. Then I have placed uh, a bolt in between, mirrored this one over like so, followed by a few additional extrusions. In this case, I have actually drawn uh, these nuts and then I have rounded off everything with some fillets and a few chamfers again. Let's also take a brief look at some of the joints. And for this reason, I'm gonna unisolate everything again. Then I switch to the top level component, make sure that the timeline is set to the far right. Then I show the tire and the rim again. And when I open up the joints folder of the top level component and hover over this rigid group, you can see that everything that is uh, turning black now is in one group. So I have grouped the tire and the rim and I have also applied this uh, revolute joint to the center. And by grounding the mounting plate here, I can now rotate the wheel like so. So let me revert the position again. And let's take a look at some uh, other joints that connect these link components. And they are placed in the suspension component down here. Again, I have used two rigid groups to group the axis and the link components together. And by doing so, I'm able to create the uh, movement or the motion by um, using only two additional joints. I think that's always a good idea to combine things and use as less joints as possible because if you're dealing with big assemblies, uh, fusion is probably slowing down the the entire process a little bit, the more joints and the more components you have in an assembly or in a design. So in this case, I'm using two additional revolute joints, one here and another one here. And then I can already start moving these parts around like so. And I have also already applied some constraints to this joint here. And you can simply do this by hovering over the joint in the browser tree, um, then this icon on the right appears. And if you click on it, um, 
Fusion prompts you with this edit joint limits box. And here you can set a minimum and the maximum value. Now this limits the rotation angle down to a total of 50 degrees, which helps to keep everything in place. Because if you are moving the parts in the assembly without any constraints, then sometimes uh, the joints start to, to spin in different directions and it's uh, quite difficult to get everything back in place. So it's a good idea to add some constraints in case you already know that some motions or some movements will not be possible later on. Next, let's continue with the differential gear. And as you can see here, I have broken Fusion 360's rule number one. So this means that I have created these bodies and all of the sketches in the top level assembly. And this is usually not a good idea. So when you start a new design, always go to the assembly drop-down menu first and create a new component, make this component active and start designing inside this component. Um, this makes your life a little bit easier when you are dealing with complex objects and of course when you are going to apply joints to the component parts and it become quite messy if you are dealing with bodies and sketches inside the top level component. Now let's roll back to the very beginning of the timeline for this design too. And I'm gonna show you the first two sketches. I'm gonna also open up the sketch folder and show them here. So as you can see, I have drawn one on the top plane and another one on the front plane, followed by three additional sketch lines. And these sketch lines help me to define the forms or to control the forms in the aloft command that comes next. So I have used the first two sketches as my profiles and the additional three sketch entities as my rails to turn this structure into a pretty complex form without losing any uh, control. And then I have used the mirror command two times to turn this into uh, a full 360 degree body. And I have done this because I was trying to create a non-uniform half of my differential gear. Then I have applied a chamfer to the end of the axis and I have drawn also uh, a line on the top view. So it was not this one here, but this one here. And I've used this sketch entity as a cutting line to cut away the front piece, like so, followed by some additional extrusions at the end of the axis, another chamfer, and then I have used the mirror command to get this one over to the other side. So let me hide the sketch again here. And I have also selected some of these uh, faces here and simply hit the delete key on the keyboard to get rid of them and to turn these faces into one connected surface. Then I have used this surface to apply a few additional extrusions. And on top of these, I have created another sketch entity or another sketch line. So it's this one here. And this one will serve as a path in the next step. But before I was importing uh, a body from another design. So this time a nut again, I was scaling it and positioning it with the align tool and the move and copy command. And then I was going to create pattern, pattern on path. And I have used the sketch entity that I have drawn before to place the nuts along this line. And I have turned it into something like this, followed by the combine command to combine the nuts with the main body. Then I have added another part at the front here. So again, by drawing a simple sketch using the revolve command to turn it into a solid. And then I have used the scale command with a non-uniform scale to squeeze it a little bit. So if it's just a simple part, like I have it here, and in case you do not need that much control, it's perfectly fine to use the scale function to adjust the form. If you are dealing with something that's a little bit more complex than this, or every time you need full control, it's um, better to draw sketches and use the love commands to turn these sketches into complex forms. Then I have 
created a few additional extrusions again and I have also placed these cross struts on the sides to support the front structure a little bit more. I've used the mirror command to place it also on the other side followed by an additional extrusion at the back. Again very simple and repetitive steps. Let's see what's next. Um, I was creating this welding seams here to hide the seams of the body a little bit. So I've done this at the back and also at the bottom and the top as far as I remember, right? And then I have closed everything off with the cylindrical part of the carbon shaft on the front. And last but not least, I have also added these handles for the supporting structure of the differential gear at the top. And this completes uh, the part. And now it is ready to get assembled in the main assembly. That's it for today's video. Thanks for tuning in. I hope I was able to give you some insights. And in the next one, I will probably already done with the suspension of the front wheels together with the steering unit. So subscribe and in case you have any questions, leave them in the comment section below and um, see you in the next one.